we're ready. First panel this morning, it will be with uh, Executive Vice President Margarete Vesteyer. She will be chairing it. And we have a distinguished group of speakers joining her. First, uh, on the occasion of the Portuguese presidency, we're honored to have with us the Portuguese Minister of Economy, Pedro Siza Vieira. Prior to his political career, Minister Siza Vieira was a practicing lawyer, university lecturer, and visiting professor. One of the aims of the Portuguese presidency is to give citizens confidence to recover from the crisis and face up to the climate and digital transformations. We have with us a member of the European Parliament, Sven Giegold. He's spokesperson for the German Greens and coordinator of the Greens EFA group in the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee. Sven was shadow rapporteur for the Greens on the Parliament's 2019 annual report on competition policy. Mechthild Wurstdorfer is the Director for Sustainability, Technology and Outlooks at the International Energy Agency. Mechthild plans and coordinates the IEA's work on energy sustainability. Previous experience includes being Director for Energy Policy at the European Commission. And then we have with us Professor Philippe Aguillon. He is a professor at the Collège, Collège de France and at the London School of Economics. His research focuses on the economics of growth, including the role of the state in the growth process. Philippe has received several awards for his work, including one for being the best European economist under age 45. Welcome to all our panelists and Margrethe, over to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think that sets us off on a, on a very uh, positive note. Uh, thank you very much uh, to my colleague, Executive Vice President uh, Timmermans. I think this was a very strong and encouraging and really, you know, hands-on uh, approach. And, and obviously, this is what is needed. As, uh, as Vice President uh, responsible for competition, obviously, I'm a subcontractor when it comes to Green Deal. But that does not change the fact uh, that we all can do uh, more uh, and, and we need to discuss how to get that right. Uh, because without, you know, thorough consideration, we will not get there. And, uh, and I'm really happy that you have accepted uh, to be part of this uh, panel today. Uh, and I would like to start with you, Pedro. I know you well uh, and I know how ambitious you are. You just uh, took over uh, the presidency of, uh, of the council. And uh, one of your first uh, ambitions is to get uh, the European climate law uh, approved. Uh, what main challenges do you see uh, for member states to achieve the green transition? And, and what is your view on, on the role of competition policy in that respect? Good morning, Margaret. And uh, good morning, uh, uh, Commissioner Timmermans, and uh, good morning to the fellow panelists, and uh, good morning to all participants. Uh, you're quite right. The, the view we have is an ambitious uh, one. And uh, actually, um, I must tell you that uh, 18 months ago, when government took office, we defined climate change as one of the four strategic challenges that the country would face in the following decade. The other being fighting inequality, the demographic challenge, and digital transition. And to be honest, uh, we do, did so because we are at the forefront of the impact of, the, um, of climate change. Uh, our country is uh, ravaged by wild forest fires every year. Uh, some parts of our territory are facing drought. Uh, we are very close to the Sahara Desert, and we are having uh, challenges in managing water supplies. We are uh, a country which has a very large uh, continental platform, and we are the first country in Europe um, per capita uh, consumption of seafood, so we have a vested interest in maintaining biodiversity in our waters. So uh, clearly, we do have a, 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 a challenge on uh, tackling climate change in which we must make our part to contribute to the world at large, but where our population is e easily mobilized to the impact that it has. And actually, we don't start from nothing. 
we have uh, for 20 years decided that we would embrace digital transition and would, the, sorry, climate transition and uh, would uh, manage uh, the uh, change from a model where we were heavily dependent on fossil fuels to start building a base of renewable energy. Uh, actually, uh, our dependency on fossil fuels were complete because we imported everything we use for energy production, whether coal, uh, oil, or more recently gas. So the trading balance that we faced as a country, as an economy, uh, could only be tackled if we uh, uh, evolved very quickly to uh, uh, facing autonomous energy uh, and the ability to uh, uh, harness the power of renewable energy. So we did a, a, a significant investment in um, uh, hydropower, in uh, wind power, and more recently, solar power. And these days, it is very easy to say that solar, for instance, is very cheap. Uh, uh, solar uh, energy is very cheap, and uh, it is easy to have a competitive proposal to uh, the countries as we uh, embrace that technology. This was not true 20 years ago. So we have, uh, we have to define a policy to increase the penetration of these energies. Uh, for instance, uh, we used feeding tariffs and we have uh, very significant uh, issues around state aid uh, for this. We, uh, we uh, of course, imposed uh, quotas in the terms of how you use uh, 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 renewable energy going forward. We use carbon taxes. And this all uh, came at a cost, uh, one for the um, taxpayer, but mostly for the energy cons uh, consumers in this country, both domestic and industrial. So it, it did have an impact. It did have an impact. Of course, uh, a result of that is that 20 years later, the penetration, for instance, of renewable energy in power production is now close to 60%. Uh, and in the total consumption, we will probably be getting to 40% very soon uh, because we are now uh, closing um, uh, two coal-fired uh, power plants in the country. Uh, as a result of that, of course, we do now have technology um, such as uh, managing smart grids, which is uh, essential if you have a very large penetration of uh, uh, renewable power plants. We have uh, national production of components to uh, a number of uh, renewable productions. So it, 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 it is a success story, but it came at a cost. And I think we should both acknowledge that there is a calling for uh, a climate uh, uh, transition, but also that this comes at the cost. So we must make sure that as we embrace the Green Deal uh, on a continental basis, we do reduce the cost and we make sure that uh, both uh, our industrial uh, producers and uh, we create the, uh, are able to transition this. Uh, but also that uh, we are able to develop uh, new business models and new technologies, which will be the basis of the future. So uh, coming to uh, your point, I do believe that efforts must be made in terms of our competition rule book. We must make sure that state, rate, state aid rules are able to support the effort that uh, both in developing new technologies which are not yet mature and making the investments uh, for our current uh, indus industrial producers are able to uh, actually transition this process without losing competitiveness. Uh, we need to um, make sure that we have a public procurement framework which enables governments to act as inducers of uh, new technologies which are more uh, environmentally friendly. Um, we must make sure that um, we do uh, balance these, uh, these two things. First, make sure that industry remains competitive. And secondly, that we create a framework where in Europe, new, new, um, new businesses, new technologies, new producers will be able to thrive. Um, 
I would uh, uh, therefore, uh, I, I am very much aligned on both the uh, Green Deal objectives uh, that Commissioner Timmerman so well expressed, but also uh, willing to work with you, Margaret, uh, in make making sure that our competition rule book is adjusted to this ambition and is not preventing this to happen. Because it is true that a competition brings innovation, but uh, it, is, it is also true that if you want to, uh, this will require new technologies to be developed, which are not yet mature. I'll give you two examples. We need renewable gases to maintain a competitive industry in Europe. We need uh, uh, electrification of the economy and of the mobility, which will require technologies that we in Europe do not uh, um, uh, have the domain. So this comes at the cost, and if we don't create the basis for this to happen, uh, producers will be uh, hanging on to those models which are uh, past and probably have no future, but uh, their present competitiveness and results uh, will require that. So we must create the framework which enables this. I will only make a, one final point. Uh, Portugal is at the tip of Europe. We are a closer, uh, the closest capital to uh, the country is uh, Morocco, is Rabat, rather than Madrid. We are the closest point to any area in the Americas, in Europe. And uh, we actually are uh, 1,700 1, kilometers away from Paris. So we live practically in an island. And air travel is fundamental to our country to ensure connectivity to the rest of Europe, but actually to the rest of the world. So uh, I wish that uh, whilst we uh, embrace new manners of transportation, which are more eco-friendly, I would also like to see that we create the conditions for the airline industry to develop new technologies of propulsion of, aerop of airplanes which are more uh, friendly to the environment. And for this, we must make sure that there is still a thriving, uh, um, a thriving business uh, going forward. So uh, thank you very much for the participation and I look forward to the further discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, also setting us, uh, I think, center of, of uh, the seemingly dilemmas of, uh, of competitiveness, uh, Green Deal investment, uh, and how to make all of that uh, come together. Uh, Sven, you're one of the champions uh, when it comes to uh, this discussion, and I am looking forward also to hear your view, uh, for instance, to the use of state aid, uh, how to do that uh, in a world that is greening. So uh, I would like you to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. And uh, may I first also uh, congratulate you for setting that uh, topic in a form of a conference uh, and uh, do, doing real policy in this area. I remember before uh, your hearing, we discussed this in a, one of these famous background talks at length, and it was not the, the most easy discussion we had. And now all these uh, topics of greening competition policy are at the center stage. So, and actually that's needed because if the Green Deal is to be a, a success, companies which do already, and there are many business models which are consistent with the Green Deal, which we need for the Green Deal, they are at the moment very often at a pricing or a general competitivity disadvantage compared to those who misuse environment, the environmental space for pollution or for overuse. And therefore, the objective of competition policy should be to set fair prices, socially and environmentally fair prices. And this means, uh, from my perspective, two things. So first, the uh, complete phase out and rapid phase out of all harmful subsidies. And second, the, the internalization of the external costs, like we do this with environmental taxation and the ETS. And lastly, as long as competition is not yet fair, because the internal prices are not yet internal, uh, the internalized, we need uh, to allow 
for green compensation in at least some cases. When it comes to state aid, I think it is uh, crucial that we have a horizontal rule. Um, a subsidy, a state aid, which is not consistent with the Green Deal, which doesn't contribute to the Green Deal, but does the opposite, cannot be seen as consistent with our internal market. It should generally not be allowed. And uh, second, we need to end uh, the remaining subsidies for fossil fuels and its infrastructure. I would like to say very clearly, we have no time anymore for investment into bridges. We have to invest into the future. When we know climate science, it tells us very clearly how quickly we have to reduce CO2. And this means there is no time for bridge technology such as gas. And there's also no time anymore for subsidies into technology which takes too long to build and to develop, such as nuclear. Uh, third, the regime should have a certain limit level of flexibility. So, uh, and that means that citizen com energy communities should be empowered, for instance, by taking them out of the obligation uh, of joining into a bidding process. Renewable energy citizens cooperatives should be allowed to thrive without overly harsh limits of um, the respective um, guidelines uh, under the state aid framework. And also, uh, I would say that if companies get together and set minimum standards when it comes to environmental and social conditions in third countries, uh, they should be allowed to do so without telling them it's a cartel. So because the Green Deal also has an external dimension, in particular when it comes to fair trade. And lastly, I would like to say that there is a space for contracts for difference. What I mean with this is, as long as the pricing is not fair, the regulation is not strict, it must be possible for states to go into specific forms of cooperation to help uh, companies to invest into sustainable business models. And this should not be seen as harmful state aid. And the last remark, uh, Margrethe, on your key issue of the digital portfolio. Uh, I think uh, the big digital companies are de facto infrastructure in a digitalized society. And therefore, their algorithms, their data sets, they should also correspond to the objectives of the Green Deal. We need an ongoing supervision of these quasi-infrastructure elements. And this permanent supervision should also have an environmental dimension. We cannot ignore that uh, some of these um, systems run with algorithms which use excessive energy, which use excessive electronic resources. Uh, they are, uh, can be done more efficiently, and, uh, and I hope also there on your leadership. Thank you, Margaret. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Uh, quite challenging, uh, I'd say, uh, compared to where we are, and also I think to some of the issues that that Pedro uh, has ahead of him uh, in order to to source uh, energy. I think, Philippe, that this has set the scene very well for you, uh, because uh, what we have heard so far is about incentive. It's about innovation. It's about how to make externalities something that is actually priced in. Uh, your work uh, is leading the way on, on these issues. So I'm, I'm looking very much forward uh, to hear your view because right now I think the scene is, is set uh, between the dilemmas of competitiveness uh, and support and how competition policy should be ranked uh, when it comes to some of these issues. So please take the floor. Am I being too loud? Do you want me to? Uh, uh, am I too loud? I don't know. Should I reduce a bit? I don't know. Can you hear me? We hear you well. Okay, good. Thanks so much, uh, Margaret, and uh, for organizing this event, um, and, for, and to the speakers, and to my uh, co-panelists. 
Uh, it's true that innovation is really the hope that we can win the fight against climate change. Uh, it's, it's, through, it's through innovation that we will discover new sources of energy, uh, new way, new uh, of housing, which is more, uh, you know, save, energy saver, new ways of producing, new ways of consuming, new ways of transport, uh, uh, and all that is through innovation that will do that. The problem is that innovation is done by the private sector, and we need the private sector, and we need firms. They are the ones who innovate primarily. The problem is that they don't spontaneously move to green innovation. Uh, I've done some studies with John Van Rinan and uh, other co-authors showing that uh, uh, when you have firms that have, uh, in the automotive industry, that have innovated in combustion engines in the past, they tend to innovate more in combustion engines in the future. You tend to keep doing what you used to do. So you don't spontaneously move to green innovation. And so you need the role of the state intervention and you need civil society intervention to overcome this past dependence problem. So let me talk about state intervention. When one first instrument to redirect innovation of firms towards green innovation is carbon tax. Obviously, the carbon tax is important. We know we have the yellow vest movement in France because we did not smartly implement the carbon tax there. We need to go back and have find a way to do a smarter way to implement the carbon tax. Okay? And, but you need the carbon tax. It's a key instrument, the carbon price. But you, it's not the only instrument. You need also subsidies to clean innovation and a smart industrial policy. You need to create in Europe, uh, Margaret, the equivalent of the ARPA energy in the US. You know, in the US, they created first the DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency during the Cold War to catch up with on defense and to make sure they would win the race with the Soviet Union at the time. But then they subsequently created the equivalent of DARPA for energy. We need to do the same in Europe. We need a European ARPA energy. And uh, that will be the other leg to uh, promote uh, green innovation. We need the carbon tax and the ARPA energy, both, okay? Uh, uh, that, uh, so that's the state intervention. But uh, uh, on top of state intervention, there is also civil society, consumers. I did a recent study, Margaret, which is exactly on your topic, competition. I showed with Roland Benabou, Alexandra Roulet, and, and another co-author, Ralph Martin, that in, in countries where consumers have a demand for green, we know that through the World Value Survey, then competition, product market competition, pushes firms to innovate greener. So in, in places where consumers have a demand for environment, competition is, is another lever of green innovation. So you see, you have carbon tax, you have the industrial policy, smart ARPA energy, but you also have competition policy, which in countries where there is a demand for environment, pushes further firms to innovate green, because if I don't, my competitor will get the consumers. So it's very interesting because I believe very much in the combination between competition policy and smart industrial policy, but industrial policy which is pro-competition and one which is very much ARPA energy driven. And I think that should be the future. Combine competition policy and smart industrial policy to push for green innovation, but of course, a uh, leadership policy which is well governed, like the ARPA energy, which is pro competition. As much as in the health sector, we need the BARDA, uh, the, the, equivalent, the European equivalent of the BARDA, of the American BARDA, exactly in the same way in the energy sector, we need the equivalent of the ARPA energy and to reconcile competition policy and what this ARPA energy would do. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I think this is um, this is really interesting how to square things, and I think it also shows, shows uh, the complexity that we are discussing today. How to enable competition to be the helper that we need, while at the same time having an industrial policy that pushes for uh, for green innovation. And uh, uh, Mechtil, you hold the key to a lot of this uh, because how we save, how we produce, how we use energy. 
uh, is indeed, I think, one of the absolute uh, key questions uh, when it comes to fighting climate change. And uh, how, how do you see the role of competition policy in this and, and also uh, the international dimension? Because energy is something that flows over borders uh, and energy dependency is definitely also a factor both when it comes to competitiveness, uh, but also when it comes to competition. So, so please take the floor. Thank you very much, Vice President, and good morning to everyone from Paris, uh, the headquarter of the International Energy Agency. So we already heard a lot about the link between energy, climate policy and competition policy. So energy is responsible for more than 75% of the CO2 emission globally and in Europe. So in order to become net zero, which is the aim of the European Green Deal and the EU as a continent to become the first one to, uh, calm neutral by 2050, we need a major, major transformation of the economy. And I'm not sure we are all aware of uh, how tremendous this transformation is, and it needs to be facilitated, and that's the theme of today, by competition policy, by industrial policy and energy climate policy. Let me just highlight the uh, immense uh, requests we have, because clean energy transition at the core is cross-sectoral. So just to highlight, we need, for example, the sales of electric vehicles, which are now 3% in Europe, to become close to 100% by 2050. We need to change completely our heating system, the infrastructure, which needs to be electrified. And nowadays, heating in Europe is mainly based on gas, oil, and sometimes coal, depending on the region. We need also our energy intensive industries, which are responsible to close to 20% of the CO2 emission industry in total, but mainly cement, steel, uh, chemicals, and others. They need to develop new technologies. They need to decarbonize their processes. And last but not least, nearly our entire building stock, 75% is energy in, in ten, uh, inefficient. So we need to further renovation. We need to become net zero buildings, uh, the existing one to attack. This brings me to my second point, the investments. We already heard we need a lot of investments. The International Agency, uh, International Energy Agency, we estimated that we would need roughly $1 trillion a year in the next three years to become sustainable recovery, to become these clean energy transitions in the future. So the next three years are quite important on our way to 2030 and 2050. And public expenditure and on innovation, infrastructure and uh, decarbonization need to raise exponentially. The Europe has started with the uh, next generation EU, seven, 750 billion euro and 37% at least uh, targeted for climate, that means energy measures. The US has just announced a stimulus package of 1.9 trillion US dollar and has put the new administration climate change and energy at the front of that. So the current revision of the state aid guidelines, as we have heard, for environmental protection and energy will be a further opportunity that to ensure that the necessary government intervention are enabled to re reshape the energy markets of, of the EU and what needs to be done also globally. We know that renewables, there have been a lot of success in the past, for example, prices for solar PV onshore and, and offshore have have gone down, they are competitive now. But if you look globally, we have renewables share in electricity sector of 25% right now, but coal is still 30%. We expect in our uh, scenarios that in a few years that will be reversed. So your renewables will be worldwide the leading uh, source for electricity. And that brings me to innovation. We talk a lot of the power sector. So power sector is responsible for 40% of the CO2 emissions, but transport is 25%, industry 20%, and refineries and others are responsible for the rest. So if we look not only at the power sector, but how to decarbonize the other sector, industry and others, we have looked at innovation and technologies. And we know in order to become net zero by 2050, 
half of the technologies are not yet mature. So a lot of the clean energy technologies, and we looked at 400 different technologies, are not mature enough right now. Some are still in the lab. So we need, with the competition policy, enable, have the framework for competition, but also to allow these new technologies to enter the market and become competitive. We need, for 2050, uh, giant leaps in innovation on the range of these technologies. And that is especially true for sectors which are so-called hard to abate. Steel, cement, chemicals, shipping, we heard about it, and aviation. There, the uh, reduction of emission is the hardest to reduce and cost-effective solutions are lacking behind. So these strong innovation efforts needs to be enabled. And we heard already battery. Battery is one of the key technology for the future. And I welcome very much also the idea you mentioned in the beginning of EPCAI to enable the infrastructure, not only for batteries, but also hydrogen. There's a lot of talk of green and renewable hydrogen, but nowadays most of hydrogen is built on gas and coal. So we need to decarbonize hydrogen and make that also possible with innovation technologies and the right framework to allow that. The last word uh, on the international dimension, as you asked. The EU is the leader with the European Green Deal in climate change. But the EU is responsible roughly for 8% of global emissions. China is responsible for nearly 30%. The US for 14%. And India right now for 7%, even the, uh, the per capita basis Indian emissions are among the lowest. So we have the four biggest emitters, which China, US, the EU, and India. So the good news is that, as we heard, it's not only the EU who has announced net zero targets, but also UK, Canada, China now by 2060, Japan, South Korea, and by the way, a lot of companies, energy companies, but also, for example, Microsoft and IT companies want to become net zero in the next couple of decades at 2050 at the latest. So we need to work together. And the EU has started with the energy and climate diplomacy, but the competition policy is part of that. So looking very much forward to the discussion on this important topic. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mechtil. Uh, and the Slido questions, they are pouring in. There is a lot of, uh, of interest uh, with our, our audience uh, here today. But before I get to, to the questions, uh, I would like to, to offer the floor if you want to make a comment uh, to any of your co-panelists' uh, interventions. Petra, would you have uh, any remarks to... Yes, uh, these were very interesting uh, uh, interventions and I thank you for all of that. I think one of the reflections that we have to make is uh, the point that Mitchell just made about the impacts of uh, other regions in the world for global emissions. And as we try to facilitate the transition, we must make sure that uh, we maintain the competitiveness of our uh, producers within uh, the global arena. So this must, must be, on the one hand, a concerted effort around the world, but on the other hand, in managing this transition in Europe, we must make sure that we don't put our producers at uh, a, 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 a less competitive, a favorable competitiveness globally. Europe is, uh, an, an, uh, is, is the largest exporter in the world, or one of the largest exporters in the world. We need to maintain uh, competitiveness around our companies, because this is where we base then the ability to stay, sustain a, a, a model, a social model, which uh, the European citizens value and which enables us to uh, provide to our citizens in Europe the uh, uh, better standards of life uh, mankind has ever met. So uh, we, uh, my, my point here is to make sure that uh, whilst we make internalization of costs uh, to the environment, we do so in a manner which is also supported by other policies, particularly those around uh, 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 the investments that need to be made. 
so uh, this is just a point of uh, managing this process in a manner which is virtuous and is not uh, uh, is not felt by citizens and companies around Europe as being a self-defeating proposal, uh, which ultimately uh, will make the uh, political support to this Green Deal uh, something which will be lost. Uh, this is going to be a long-term effort. Uh, we have, of course, to front load the, the efforts that we are making in this decade that we are just now starting, but we must sustain political support for this. So we must make sure that we manage this transition also uh, in view of these uh, perspectives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sven, uh, comments to your co-panelists? Well, <laughs> There was uh, two things which uh, struck me. Uh, so first, I would like to say to Paris, uh, bonjour uh, d'abord. Uh, I, I think we should not talk about 2050. 2050, if we are too slow in the adaptation phase, we have no chance to containing climate change. So we must speak about rapid changes until 2030 and in particular in the more richer parts of the world. Therefore, uh, I would say, if I look at the graph, which sectors actually cause climate change emissions in Europe, for 90% of the things, we have the technology and the alternatives. We have some critical sectors where it's difficult, but for energy production, for traffic, also for heating of buildings, a lot of the agriculture and forestry, the construction sectors, the alternatives are ready. We have some hard cases uh, which you mentioned. And therefore, it's so important to set the framework right now. And I would disagree to see there a contradiction between fair competition and competitiveness. This I've heard so often. So we have to we cannot allow fair competition because it's harming competitiveness. I think it's just the other way around. Uh, only if we have rules for fair competition where the prices say the environmental truth, uh, companies will invest early in the future technology so that they have a competitive advantage. And of course, there are companies which face difficulties in the innovation cycle. And therefore, for these companies, we need to have a framework of targeted uh, support. And this is why I also ask, which is not so usual for, for the Greens, perhaps, for the possibility for industrial policy with contracts for difference. But setting the prices right and getting harmful subsidies out, while at the same time allowing with industrial policy companies to invest early, this will strengthen European competitive competitivity. It is uh, the basis for a region in the world running on technology mainly and our ideas in order to compete in the future. And everybody who is constructing this contradiction uh, between competitivity and uh, fair competition is risking our future economic livelihood. That's at least our conviction. Thank you. I, I think, uh, Philippe, uh, uh, that is something for yeah. you to comment. To, uh, I think I agree with most of what was said. I, I have maybe two small points of uh, uh, where I may not fully agree with uh, what the, my previous speaker said on the, the bridge technologies. Uh, I've done a study on uh, gas, and of course, you you know that I think there is a way to manage bridge technologies smartly, to combining them with uh, carbon tax and subsidies to renewable, which can uh, mitigate the, the you know the pitfalls of the bridge and take advantage of the short run advantage. So I, there, I think it depends. All depends how you do it. Uh, so I have recent work on that uh, with Darren Asemoglu and uh, uh, and David Demus and Lynn Barrage, which I can, which really analyzes that in detail. And I'm happy to share that with you. 
the other thing is on the nuclear, similarly, uh, the nuclear, if we can modernize some nuclear plants in France, uh, it's not that we should be necessarily new nuclear plants. Of course, we have to put, to invest a lot in renewable energy, new source of energy, in the fusion uh, source. You know, that we, we need to uh, investigate many, many new ways. But uh, maintaining nuclear plants in France, uh, unlike Germany, I think was a smart choice. Uh, because if France now contributes to less than 1% of the world CO2 emissions, it's a lot thanks to our nuclear plants and our hydroelectric plants. I mean, so I don't think we can be a serious climate person and ask that we close all nuclear plants today. It's just irresponsible. I mean, doing like what Germany did, uh, and with all my respect for Germany uh, uh, and my admiration for Germany, I think was a very silly pol policy. We should not do the same. I mean, we should have managed the transition smartly. Uh, of course, the future is not in nuclear, but the idea that we should go against nuclear, I think this is a, that's not the way that you will solve the climate problem. I know we disagree on that, but I'm not saying that we should put our eggs there. We say that we have to manage the transition smartly. I think this is uh, actually excellent because this shows that we did not put this panel together in, in order to have agreement uh, and to mislead, uh, mislead our audience that, that everyone will agree on this. Uh, but I would like you, Mechil, uh, to, to take the floor as well uh, to comment on, uh, on what your, your co-panelists said. Thank you. I, I don't want to go to the debate on nuclear and gas, but I wanted to add one point uh, because it's true we speak 2050, 2030. But in my view, we have to underline the urgency for the next three years in investments. The chances given by the sustainable recovery plans from Europe, but all over the world, is there to invest in clean energy. And that will bring the jobs. We have done a study together with IMF that if we invest $1 trillion per year in the next three years globally, that will create 9 million jobs and give economic growth. So the focus is right uh, to combine uh, our ambitions with jobs, competitive, competitiveness and competition. And I, I, I would say that here the focus, the most jobs are in the energy efficiency renovation area in our studies, followed by renewables, uh, um, grids and all that. These are jobs intensive. And I think it's the governments right now should focus and we should enable to combine exactly that competitiveness and our clean energy transition in the longer term. But the next years are absolutely crucial. Thank you. Well, if, if the next years are, are crucial, I think one of the questions, and I said the slider questions, they are, they are pouring in. Uh, one question may then be very topical, um, uh, which is what uh, Pedro took us through. Uh, Portugal is de facto an, an island. Uh, at least short haul uh, flights are crucial uh, for connectivity uh, reasons. How, how, to, how to bridge that? How to make sure uh, that on the one hand side we can have connectivity, while on the other hand side uh, realizing uh, the problems that we have in, uh, in flying and, and airlines. Uh, anyone with, a, with a, an answer to this? Philippe, would you start? Sorry, your question. Sorry, I missed. How to, uh, uh, how to on the one hand side, uh, live up uh, to the connectivity needs uh, in a country like Portugal, where flying is, is really essential for the yeah, connectivity, and, uh, and, and while at the same time uh, having these calls to be much more restrictive when it comes to flying? Yeah, you, <coughs> yeah, I, I um, so that I. There again, I need. I think you need to manage the to manage the transition. I think uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know myself if I will fly as much. I think COVID. <laughs> taught, I discovered Zoom. I think uh, it's true that I, uh, there are many conferences now that I would not uh, take a plane to go there. You see what I mean? Uh, I think Zoom has changed my life. I will fly much less to the US, for example. I used to go to the US 10 times a year. I think I will fly once or twice a year to the US. I don't see myself going there all the time uh, and, 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 and spending time in the airports and all that. I think it's good to have the future to, to think about the, you know, the, 
the, the airline, the airline transportation of the future. But I think also that we've discovered that there are a number of things we can do without having to fly. I mean, that's, uh, that's part of the post-COVID world. And, uh, uh, and we, need to, we need to act on both. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so, so I think, and so the, the, I think we, that's what innovation allows you to do. Where you can explore multiple ways of, uh, you know, of uh, being active, and uh, uh, you know, while, while, while you know, reconciling, uh, you know, growth and uh, and the environment. Uh, and I think that we should be very open. I think we should not preclude anything. I think we have to to be very open on all the possibilities we have. Well, Pedro, uh, does Zoom solve your connectivity issue? I, I, dream, I dream of the moment when we will find uh, airplanes which can be propulsed by using hydrogen uh, cells or uh, solar energy or the like. And uh, this would allow that the movement of people, which is a trend of humanity, people move around the world and have done so ever since we left Africa. And uh, we need to make sure that these movements are capable of being done in a manner which is uh, environmentally friendly. And whilst we can, uh, whilst Philippe can, uh, can do conferences by uh, by way of um, by way of Zoom and thereby reducing its own uh, its own uh, travel, uh, it is true that we are going to see a lot of people continue to move around the world, and uh, we can certainly use more efficient transportation by air, by land. But we also make sure that, uh, for instance, both uh, ships and airplanes continue to provide trans to satisfy transportation needs in a manner which is efficient. But to do so, we must make sure that there continues to be a market so that it is uh, useful to invest in these new technologies. So basically, again, it's how we manage this transition. And I would very much like to see teletransportation becoming a reality. But uh, uh, be before we, we get there, I think it's easier to find an environmentally friendly airplane. Yeah, I, I, think, you're, I think you're right. We, we, we should not stay at home until we have teletransportation. I think that would uh, a lot of families would be really sad uh, if that was the case. Shortly, uh, if you would want to comment on this, Sven, and may I add uh, a slider question for you? Um, as Philippe uh, said, uh, consumer choice can make a difference where there is a competitive market. Uh, and here uh, there's a, a question. Uh, consumer choice are important for the green transition. However, several companies use greenwashing to gain unfair advantages. Uh, what can competition policy do? If you would want to comment on, on that as well. Well, um, so uh, first uh, on the debate uh, concerning air transport, I agree. I'm a, I confess I'm a Star Trek fan, and this is well consistent uh, with uh, green policies. Uh, therefore, I agree uh, we need uh, to beam. Uh, that is really where we have to what we have to dream of, and uh, in a globalized world needs, of course, uh, mobility uh, on top of. Uh, teleconferencing, and I hope we have a European Zoom rather soon, uh, uh, so uh, with our data protection standards. So, um, but however, until we have invented this, and we should do what we can in order to invent green flying, uh, we cannot pursue a policy of limited endless growth. And this means the growth rates in air transport before the corona crisis were a real problem for the environment. Therefore, I think the prices have to say also in this area the, the reality. So at the moment, kerosene is not taxed. Uh, the ETS is not effective enough. And we are letting other generations and the global poor pay for our air transport. And the air transport globally 
is a phenomenon of the middle class and the upper classes. And therefore, it is important also for social reasons to price uh, air transport and at least migrate to update the state aid guidelines so that subsidies to useless and inefficient small airports everywhere, including in Germany, uh, are phased out and come to an end. So uh, uh, this means inventing the future and regulating the present right and fairly is not uh, mutually exclusive. We have no time only to talk about the future invention. And when it comes to greenwashing, I have to say, yeah, this is a widespread phenomenon. Uh, and uh, there are two key things. So the European Commission is planning to um, uh, increase the reporting obligations for all companies, uh, in particular in the green area, so that uh, the taxonomy for sustainable finance can work. Because when companies are transparent in which sectors they actually invest, earn their money, uh, and uh, whether they are sustainable or not, uh, uh, then uh, the greenwashing is limited. Uh, so therefore, it's so important, Margrethe, that you and your colleagues don't get distracted by all the lobbyists who are saying they don't want to be transparent, they don't want uh, the taxonomy to be binding and to be strict. No, investors should know what's sustainable and what is not sustainable, and the Commission is on the right track here. Well, thank you very much. Um... It's, it's not always you say that, so uh, so thank you very much for that, uh, Sven. Uh, Mechtil, uh, I have a, a question uh, for you uh, from, from Slido, which is this um, dilemma between the ETS system uh, and a carbon tax. Uh, how do you see this? Do you think, as uh, Sven was just suggesting, that the ETS system is not efficient uh, enough? Uh, and, and how do you see that? Should, should we rather go into focusing on, on carbon border, uh, on carbon tax as such, uh, rather than, than keep renewing and, and focusing on the ETS system? Thank you very much. I think the ETS, as it was mentioned, is working very well. It's the centerpiece of, of climate uh, change, and the prices are around 33 euros. So it, it, it starts to have an impact, or it has an impact. And other countries like China wants to introduce ETS this year for the power sector. So this is a good element. In our view, it's not sufficient to drive the clean energy transition. We still need policies and works, for example, for renewables and energy efficiency target to bring it up. So this needs to be complementary. It's a good sign that carbon taxes, ETS, and um, widening ETS, for example, in the aviation sector, is certainly something which can help in that aviation sector, which, by the way, uh, has been hard hit by, by COVID. But there are also good examples uh, of, of helping uh, the airline companies to go out of the crisis, like Air France in France. There's a conditionality uh, on some of the green aspects of it. Uh, for uh, example, uh, flights within France should uh, not take place anymore. So there are ways out to help out of that. But coming back to ETS and carbon prices and carbon taxes, I think it's a very good mean, but it's not sufficient. And when it comes to the proposal of the Commission on the carbon border adjustment, I think this is a complex issue and it needs to be well studied, but it's a good tool to look both at carbon leakage, but also to push others to step up their efforts. As I mentioned, there are already uh, more and more 2050 pledges, but not that covers only 60% of the world CO2 emissions. So we need to do more. So I think in that way, uh, the Commission is on the right way. Well, thank you very much. It's getting better and better. Now, two speakers have said the Commission is, uh, is on the right way. Um, slowly but surely, we are uh, getting towards uh, the coffee uh, break. Uh, I think I have a question for you, Pedro. Um, which is if, if member states will finally commit uh, immediately to stop subsidizing fossil fuels uh, in the, the EU, uh, not just in, in third countries, uh, as a thing in, in the climate law. Uh, and also for me, this is an interesting question, where are member states uh, here? Uh, because our state aid rules, well, they can be reformed, but of course that will happen in, in consultation. 
Uh, so I, I think it's, uh, it would be nice to know where do you think member states stands on this to stop subsidizing um, uh, energy that is that is not uh, renewable uh, or uh, or otherwise at least uh, carbon neutral. Thank you. That is a key, a key question, and I think it is important that this is tackled uh, on at least a continental basis, because otherwise there would be arbitrage. We would put, if we move uh, separately around countries, we would put uh, the producers in some countries at a disadvantage in respect of others. So I think it is important that we have a process which is uh, coordinated and, and, and mandatory uh, within the European Union. We have started to reduce our subsidies or rather uh, tax exemptions that we have uh, in our country that has, uh, paid, that has been instrumental in the closure of uh, two of our coal-fired power plants. So we will not have uh, coal-fired electricity in, in Portugal in the coming, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in around two years' time. We will, uh, there are some certain areas which are becoming extremely inefficient precisely because we are doing this. We are closing a refinery, uh, an oil refinery in the north of Portugal. It's, it's going to happen uh, this year uh, still. So this has a tremendous impact both socially and, and, uh, and economically. And we must make sure that uh, these efforts are coordinated around Europe, uh, because what we want to make sure is that uh, no producer around Europe gets unfair advantages uh, by uh, uh, countries moving uh, these targets uh, at different places. Again, as I said, we must make sure that we coordinate this globally because we don't want to put Europe uh, on its own at a disadvantage to other producers around the world. And finally, again, I think uh, the uh, recovery plan, the European recovery plan must be put in place very, very fast because otherwise uh, countries such as ours uh, are facing uh, a tremendous difficulty in making sure that we manage this transition. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And, and I can assure you, uh, all over Europe, uh, parliaments are ratifying uh, uh, the necessary legislation in order for us actually uh, to get the European funds so that they can be uh, distributed and very encouraged uh, by the work uh, done uh, by member states to draft their, their recovery and resilience plans. Um, we have covered a lot of ground, um, but uh, just maybe a one-minute challenge uh, for you, uh, Philippe, uh, because we have been going back and forth uh, between uh, competition policy, state aid, uh, industry. And I have a question here. Is there a contradiction between the goals of competition policy and those of industrial policy uh, in the light of Green Deal? It's important, Margaret, to have, before we used to have a very ideological uh, view, because we, we, competition is key to innovation, so you are really at the heart of the process. But there was the view before that if you are pro-competition, you should rule out any sectoral state aid. And it was a kind of ex ante legalistic approach in a sense. And I'm much more in favor of a pragmatic approach. I think you can very well have sectoral state aids, you know, that are com consistent with competition. You don't help only one firm, you help many firms. You don't, you don't do it at the expense of potential entrants. You factor in potential entry. So you can very well manage industrial policy, which is pro-competition. And uh, here is a case in point. We need competition policy because competition, through, through competition, consumers will push towards greener in production and innovation. But we also need the ARPA energy and smart industrial policy uh, in the energy sector. And we can make it pro uh, competition friendly. And I think the big challenge now is to reconcile industrial policy, competition policy. Uh, it's very important before they used to be done very separately within the European Commission. It's very important that they be done jointly as much as possible. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, maybe I should have given you more one minute challenges that would have made even more room for, for slider questions. Uh, a number of the slider questions uh, also comment uh, on what has been said. So, so indeed, really interesting. Um, 
And we have touched upon so many different issues here. Uh, this is not the time for conclusions, uh, but this panel has set the scene for what we will be discussing uh, for the rest of the day. And I think indeed already now a lot of food for thought. Uh, I can tell you, Philippe, that in, in my portfolio, I exactly have the responsibility for our uh, industrial policy while being uh, the commissioner for competition. And, uh, and, and I think we, we need both, uh, but we should never, ever give up uh, open, uh, competitive, fair markets because that drive uh, is, is indeed needed. And we also just touched upon the international dimension here. Uh, and of course, as uh, Mechtil uh, said, uh, Europe is 8% uh, of global emissions. But one of the things that has impressed me over the last year and a half, uh, two years, uh, is that when, when Europe said we want to be climate neutral uh, by 2050, uh, we were basically the only ones taking that pledge. And now it becomes a, a global phenomenon. Uh, so there is indeed uh, something to be gained uh, by moving and leading uh, the process, uh, even though we are not uh, the main emitters uh, on this planet. I want warmly to thank uh, each and every one of you uh, for taking part in, in this panel. I really appreciate that you spent your time with us. I hope you have time to, uh, to stick around uh, also for the rest of the panels. I, for, for my sake, will do so, uh, looking very much forward for the rest of the day. Now we have time for a coffee break, uh, and uh, then we'll see each other later. Indeed, many thanks, Margrethe, and thank you, of course, to all, all the panelists. We are now taking a short break, and we will see you again at 10.40. While you grab a coffee or a tea, I'll leave you with a short video about the call for contributions, which has prepared the ground for this conference. See you at 10.40. Bye. Hi everyone, I'm Andrea Ozai and I'm a case handler in the merger network of DG Competition since 2018. It has been very much exciting to work on such a big project involving colleagues from across different instruments of DG Competition. When we launched the call for contributions, we expected to trigger an innovative and broad debate on the interplay between, on the one hand, competition policy and competition enforcement, and on the other hand, sustainability. We published the call for contributions in 23 languages and we worked very much closely with representations in the member states to be able to reach as wide an audience as possible. We received replies from stakeholders based in 26 member states and in eight different languages. Hello, my name is Irmak Izumje. I'm a case handler at DG Competition since 2019. I've had a personal interest in this subject for a while now, so I'm glad to be able to contribute also in a professional capacity. It's been great to see how so many people and organizations have actually been thinking about how competition policy can play a part in the green transition. We have received contributions from over 200 stakeholders, industry associations in different sectors, law practitioners, academics, and concerned citizens across the union. The submissions received have included comments on all three instruments, antitrust, state aid, and mergers. Comments on each of these three instruments reflect the broad range of stakeholders who have provided input to how competition policy can contribute to the challenges of implementing the European Union's Green Deal. Sustainable development must drive the internal market. This is the only way economic decisions can be in line with the treaties. This is why Client Earth is calling for a change of perspective in state aid and competition law. Negative externalities must always be counted in the assessments. Environmental benefits, not only economic ones, must be taken into account. In antitrust, the Commission can already allow green agreements, so long as they are not unduly distortive. But greenwashing must be sanctioned. We also call for widening the notion of benefits for consumers, to include benefits for society and for future generations. For mergers, the legitimate interest clause should include sustainability goals. The legal tools are there. Let's employ them to build a prosperous future. Food and drink industry is Europe's largest manufacturing industry, made up of almost 300,000 businesses, 99% of which are SMEs. Contributing to the Green Deal is a top priority for the industry. 
food and drink businesses will always seek to use the sustainability of their products as a competitive advantage. However, cooperation is necessary when sustainability objectives are unachievable individually. For example, in relation to plastic recycling, cooperation in R&D or procurement or sharing certain information is needed to increase available volumes of food grade recycled plastics. To explore these cooperation opportunities, companies need more guidance and legal certainty from the Commission. Promoting sustainability is a critical goal that we should all seek to contribute to, including from a competition law perspective. Here are a few thoughts from ICLA, the Association of In-House Competition Lawyers. First, climate change calls for specific treatment in the form of separate guidance and the return of comfort letters, as well as a slightly reoriented consumer welfare analysis. The current circumstances call for a loosening or at least a more flexible approach towards certain types of collaboration. Second, from an M&A perspective, we believe that European competition forces should be able to better facilitate concentrations that create businesses with stronger environmental credentials. Practical challenges, such as how best to assess the green credentials of an acquirer, or how best to address possible uncertainty of outcomes, or how to ensure consistency with other m and screening mechanisms, those are all challenges that may need to be addressed early on. At the European Trade Union Confederation, we call for more sustainable competition policies, promoting environmental and social progress across all strands of competition law. Greater account should be taken on non-monetary value and non-price efficiencies, creating benefits for not only consumers, but also for workers. These are just some of the many contributions we have received. You can find them all on the DG Competition website on Europa. Thank you.